Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna continue the conversation of applying Taylor series in different applications. This first example actually is a lot like examples we've done in the past, where we're going to use previous Taylor series representations to develop a representation for a certain function. But then you'll see next, we're going to use some tricks and kind of going the opposite direction in identifying a, a series and then being able to evaluate an exact value for that series given its similarity or exactness after manipulation to one of our Taylor series representations. In this first example here, we're being asked to find the McLaren series for the hyperbolic sign. If you haven't seen this much, it's probably not a big deal in your life right now. I won't talk about much about the hyperbolic sign in detail, but it has important applications that you'll see throughout mathematics and physics. Um, just to say it's a sign, we have a cosine version also, and they're based off the hyperbola, not the circle like normal sine and cosine. Um, and if there is this concept of hyperbolic geometry that they're very important for. For us, it's just really interesting in how they interact and they act a lot like our normal sine and cosine that are based on the unit circle. But I digress. This is actually the representation I'm gonna give is often one of these common ones that you'll see on these tables. So this is the de definition of the hyperbolic sine. Um, but importantly here, I'm gonna rewrite this just to make it easier on my life as one half times e v x minus e to the negative x. And what I'm going to do, okay, so represent this, is I'm going to replace the e to the x and the e to the negative x with the Taylor series, series, Taylor series representations. The only trick I need to do is use composition here and throw a negative x in here, which will actually make this an alternating series, and you'll see how I put these together. Um, but I'll throw that negative in here and then throw this in below. So let's uh, let's give ourselves some space here and come over here. So if we do that, we have a one half and then this Taylor series for e to the x is just the summation from k equals zero to infinity of x to the k over k factorial. And then we're gonna subtract the sum from k equals zero to infinity of simply negative x to the k over k factorial. And since I don't wanna rewrite this all again, I'm going to erase this and just separate the, the one to the k and the x to the k, just so it's very clear to me, there's this alternating going on. And then what I'm going to do, just cause I think it clarifies the next step, is I'm actually gonna put these two power series together. And I know I'm allowed to do that if they're both on the, the same interval of convergence, which they are from negative infinity to infinity. The composition of that negative x does not change that right here. Um, I can combine these, and so what I get is one half, and then I get the sum from k equals zero to infinity. And then now, the way I'm gonna think about this, which I think is really helpful here, is I'm going to think about this as one term together. Oh, I lost my little k up there, I noticed now. That gives the alternation over k factorial. And now importantly, what I'm going to do is make a quick analysis of these terms right here. So I'll just label this right here, uh, these a sub k's. And importantly, when I'm looking at this, I know that when k is even, this factor right here of negative one to the k will end up being a positive one which means this will actually have no effect and it will be x to the k over k factorial minus the exact same thing. So in the case when k is even, I know that this a to the k, this kth term of this sigma sum right here will equal zero. And then in a very similar but opposite way, when my k value is odd, what I'll get in this case is a negative one, so I'll have a negative exponent on this alternating factor right here. Then they'll turn this into an addition. So instead of canceling for the even terms, the odd terms, I'll just get a double up of this statement right here. So a to the k is going to equal two times x to the k over k factorial. So importantly here, and I, and I can expand this out, and maybe I should before I write my statement, but importantly, what's going on is I won't be writing anything for these k values when they're even, because I'll just get zero and adding or subtracting zero doesn't do anything. Um, but when k is odd, I get these doubling ups. And again, I don't need to think deeply about when I'm gonna write this expanded form, because I have done the logic right here. I know what the kth term will be for when it's even or odd. 
So I have one half right here. So when I have k equals zero, well, zero is even, so I leave that. When k equals one, what it will look like is two times x to the one over one factorial. When it's two, it goes away. When it's three, I'll get two times x to the third over three factorial. And let's just do a couple more, x to the fourth, that will be zero, so I don't need to add that on. And then when I get five, I'll have plus two times x to the fifth over five factorial. And this same pattern will keep happening. Importantly here to this conversation is the fact that I have this one half on the outside, but I know from this analysis right here that every term will have this factor of two. So this was just like in a previous example when I have this infinite series and I know something very important about each of those terms and that, that pattern or that nature that I analyze, I know has to occur in every term. This factor of two is the same thing. So I'll cancel this one, cancel the one half times each of these factors in each of these terms all the way along. And then look at what I have right here. And what I have is a pretty um, clear series. And I just have these odd exponents divided by this odd factorial. So I can write this summation and we'll just go from k to zero and now what I need to do is I'm going to make the adjustment up here where I get this 2k plus 1 which as we iterate k just represents the evens and then divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. So as I was saying at the beginning of this video and I just think it's very interesting that when you start playing with the hyperbolic sine or hyperbolic cosine um, you end up thinking, man, this is almost exactly the same as the sine function. And this is showing up in this Taylor series representation. So look at this. We didn't use the sine anywhere in this. We use this representation or the definition of the hyperbolic sine. When we generated this power series, take a look real quick about how eerily close it is to the sine um, power series or Taylor series right here. The only difference between them is that alternation that we get with the sine. We don't have the alternation here with the hyperbolic sine. And just to give a hint in your future work, if you're ever dealing with a power series and you're thinking, man, this is so much like the sine power series or Taylor series, except for the one I'm looking at doesn't have the alternation, think about that and consider using the hyperbolic sine. All right, in this example, we're gonna show you a really cool application of using Taylor series to evaluate an infinite series. Importantly, the series I'm looking at right here is not a power series or a Taylor series. Importantly there is because I don't have this variable x. But as I'm looking at that, it looks like this is the spot where that x would be. My first thing to do when I'm looking at this is to try to figure out which of these series this somewhat represents. And I could act like I'm looking through a lot of these, but I'm looking specifically for the alternation, which is important, and this coefficient down here. I'm just trying to find something similar. This exponent is important also, but I can always make some changes and some manipulations to make different things happen. And in this case right here, I'm looking at the tangent inverse of x. This looks exactly the same as far as the alternation goes and this divisor of 2k plus 1. The only issue is the exponent that I have going on up here. And now importantly again to say, what I'm working with here is not a power series, so I'm allowed to use a bit different tricks than I've done previously. Uh, we've done more recently with the power series. I use my normal infinite series rules. But what I'm going to do, I'm gonna work hard to get this exponent to look exactly like that 2k plus one right there. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the 1 fourth as 1 half squared. So everything else will look exactly the same. So I have the summation from zero to infinity of this alternating factor right here. And what I get now is one half squared to the k minus three all over two k plus one. And now this works really beautifully and something to re re remember when attacking these. Since I rewrote the one fourth as one half squared, what I'm going to do now is a property of exponents and apply this two to each of those terms up in that exponent right there. And so I'll have the summation again from k equals zero to infinity 
Um, all this is the same. The interesting thing is what's going on here. So I'm going to have one half to the 2k minus 6. Again, importantly, I distributed that 2 to both of those terms in that exponent all over the 2k plus 1. And then I'll make my next move without rewriting this whole thing again since I'm just doing small manipulations. But what I'm looking at is this right here. What I want to write this as is 2k plus 1 plus or minus some constant so I can work with that 2k plus 1. And if I look at this right here, 2k minus 6, I can think of as the same thing as 2k plus 1. I'll put that in parentheses just for it so it's easier for me to visualize. So that's the same as 2k plus 1 minus 7. So if I simplify this statement right here, we would all agree those are the same. And so what I'm going to do now is just replace that 2k minus 6 with this 2k plus 1 minus 7 statement. And really the only tricky stuff here will be remembering all your exponent rules. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to split this up with one half into the 2k plus 1 part and then multiply that by one half to the negative 7. Again, it's just a, it's a property of exponents using the multiplicative nature and adding the exponents um, or subtracting the exponents, I guess, in this case. Um, but if I have 1, negative 1 to the k, I'll now have one half and this is time, raised to the 2k plus 1 times 1 half raised to the negative 7 there all over 2k plus 1. And that's really the crazy trick right there. Um, what I am going to do right now, and again, since I don't have a ton of room, only a little, little bit of room left, I'm going to pull out this factor, kind of clean stuff up here, take this 1 half raised to the negative 7 and bring it out front of the summation. I can do that because it's just a constant factor unaffected by the, ver the iterative variable k. And so here I've done that. I've pulled out that factor of 1 half to the negative 7. Um, now importantly, I'm looking at this. This is now set up exactly like the tangent inverse. Um, the difference is, is I've plugged in this 1 half for the x. And actually then I can re-represent this with tangent inverse of 1 half as long as this value of 1 half is on the interval of convergence which it is, thank God, this problem would have blown up in my face if it wasn't. So one half lies on the interval from negative one to one. Um, so this right here can be represented by the really the composition of the constant one half being plugged in here. And so this whole sum equals one half to the negative seven, which was that a factor came from that adjustment I was making to that k minus three up there from the very beginning. And then this series right here is the tangent inverse of one half. So to wrap up this example and the one previously, first and foremost, whenever you have a series expression that you're trying to use a Taylor series a representation for, it's important to know what you can manipulate and what you can't manipulate. Importantly here to really emphasize, I was able to pull out this factor of one half to the negative seven because that was a constant factor that wasn't um, being manipulated by the value of k. And again, I pulled that out of this part right here. The tricky step was writing that one-fourth as one-half squared. But after that, it just had some easy manipulation to go right there. And then from this statement to this statement, I just want to clarify, we know that on the interval from negative one to one, so all of those x values, the tangent inverse of that x value can be will be represented by this infinite series right here, but that's vice versa. In this case right here, I had exactly the same thing, except I had this one half plugged in, which is on my interval of convergence. So I know that if I plugged in one half in tangent inverse, it's exactly equivalent by its representation, representative Taylor series on negative one to one. And then to go back for that first example, whenever you're looking to create a Taylor series, make sure you will rely heavily on a list of known Taylor series. And again, this isn't an exhaustive list. You can find them in your textbook or in other resources online. Well, all you're looking to do is A, make sure you obey the rules for these infinite power series, um, and B, replace all the non simple expressions inside of your, your statement with the power series. In the first case with the hyperbolic sign, it was pretty clear we were going to use this e to the x. And then the second case, we would compose negative x into that e to the x to represent the e to the negative x power series.